Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards, because we are the best, and we're not wizards, no matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs> feeling okay um, until like I realised you were a doctor so that means you're obviously you've you've managed to persuade people that you're super intelligent and I feel quite <laughs> quite intimidated by that because I think in in certain spaces I think it's quite easy for me to blag myself as as somebody who knows a little bit about board games and what I'm actually very very good at doing is just getting people on who know an awful lot about board games and I just know when to write ask the right questions. So so when I was faced with, you know, obviously having a conversation with someone like yourself who who is an academic, um I must feel I've never been <coughs> I was I was less intimidated by Stephen Bonacore knowing that he knew that I didn't like his game. <laughs> so Oh dear. <laughs> well I should. I guess I should preface this by saying that I'm, you know, I'm. I'm not a real medical doctor, nor am I actually a doctor of um, game studies. Although my research now, I, I guess I'd consider myself to be a game scholar. Yes. But my PhD is actually in atmospheric physics, so it's 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 far removed. So don't worry, you're you're far you're far more qualified than I am, Richard, for all of this. So you're a fake. Yes, he's a fake. <laughs> 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 He's an absolute... No, that's fine. I feel better already. That's okay. I can look at the sound waves now. Um, I'm like... Um, his, what's his face in the Matrix? You know, he says... I I'm don't. Neo, I, yeah. yeah, you're Neo, and I'm the... I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm the slightly bo- You're the character the Lawrence Fishburne bo- plays. No, I'm not even him. I'm the other one. The Joe, is it like Joe Pantalamo or whatever? You know, the guy that says I don't even see the code anymore. You know, I'm the kind of the, I'm the kind of the sleazy balding one that, you know, kind of does anything for a steak, which is pretty, pretty true. To be fairly, I'm perfectly honest. Um, so, so your official title. <clears throat> just getting this right. I'm actually having a clearing of the throat just to make sure I pronounce this correctly. It's Dr. Sam Ellingworth, Senior Lecturer in Science Communication and Bowtie Studies. Is that is that is that correct? It's, it's exactly what we I have, am and who I am. Absolutely. We have to tackle the bow tie situation at some point in the conversation. You do realise that. Not from a um you understand, not from a, a kind of a using it for light comic relief, because um, I'm assuming, and you know, we don't have to do an intro here. I'm joined by, as I say, Dr. Sam Illingworth. Is it Illingworth or is it Eilingworth? I, I never even, that's ridiculous. No, no Ill- Illingworth's perfect. You got it absolutely spot on. That's good. I'm so pleased. Um, I am actually, that sounded sarcastic. Um, let's start off with, I think, the most important question, um, which is, you are a man who sports a bow tie. Is this, do you switch between elasticated and actual ones that you tie? Or are you about, if you, or if we were in the street, would you now be raising your glove to my face and slapping my face twice and going, how dare you, sir? I tie these, my very self. So I have a selection of bow ties that I can tie and I know how to tie a bow tie, yes. but I mainly wear elasticated ones simply because, <clears throat> simply because the, the patterns that are available on the elasticated ones tend to be better. So oh, right. it's just, it's just for, it's just for sartorial reasons more than anything else. The, the reason I actually wear a bow tie is 
I when I, I lived in Japan for a couple of years, and for some unknown reason, one of the first things I learned how to say, which I've forgotten now, is I wear a bow tie on a Friday to celebrate the weekend. And then it meant I had to wear a bow tie every Friday, and then it started being every day. <laughs> and so you actually learned the kind of the days of the week. So <laughs> what we've discovered so far, because this is almost turning into like one of those sting operations, is that you don't actually always tie a bow tie and your doctorate is going to hunt and do with games. You know, I'm just wondering what other... Basically. I was expecting... Fake news. Fake news. Don't use that. That it is. I was expecting, you know, an academic discussion. I didn't realise we were going to be... I was going to be like that Dom, don't get done, get Dom guy. And you were like one of these plasterer boys that had only put up two sheets of plaster when you were supposed to put up six. And you've got this crying old age pensioner in the corner who's saying, he promised me a proper bow tie. He promised me a proper bow tie. And then he was flicking out with his elastic. I'm kind of interested in a couple of things because I'm interested in um, the area that you're in at the moment is obviously you kind of, you said you're kind of getting into the kind of the ap- academic side of kind of gaming, which I think is fascinating. We did have um, Holly Nielsen on the show um, probably a good three, four months ago. And uh, she was talking, she's actually going ahead to study her PhD directly in the history of board games. Um, oh, and it's, she was picking like a certain kind of time scale. So um, in terms of your involvement in the hobby, um, is where you are now, is it kind of like a happy, is it a happy accident? I mean, did you have a particular kind of career route kind of planned out? When you first, I mean, what what did you study first of all at kind of um, at kind of university? Okay, so my a brief potted history of myself. So I did an undergraduate degree in physics with space science and technology. Right. Then I did um, a PhD in atmospheric physics, but I was um, basically using satellites and aircraft and drones to make measurements of greenhouse gases at the Earth's surface. Right. But I was really interested in how to communicate science with Mm non-scientists. And in particular, I was super interested in how theatre could be used to do that. So after my PhD, I went to Japan and worked in a Japanese theatre on a a scholarship looking at the relationship between science and theatre. Then came back to the UK and then continued working in on research aircrafts for a little while. And then what I was really passionate about was developing dialogue between scientists and non-scientists and in particular giving voice to audiences that might be perceived as being traditionally underserved or underheard and one of the ways in which I, I did that is through poetry so my research really focuses around the use of poetry to enact dialogue between scientists and non-scientists and then about Four or so years ago, my colleague, um, Dr. Paul Wake, who's a reader in English at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, mm-hmm. me and him got chatting. We realized we both had a massive passion about um, tabletop games and we set up the Manchester Game Studies Network. And through the Manchester Game Studies Network, which is a collection of academics at Manchester Metropolitan University and other institutes across the world, people working on board game studies. And what I'm really interested in and what Paul's interested in as well is how we can use tabletop games to facilitate dialogue. So how we can use the space around the table and away from the table Mm. to enable people to have conversations. So really, you know, this came about as an opportunity for Paul and I to work together, to find colleagues who had similar interests Mm. and to use tabletop games as a facilitatory medium through which to explore our research. Obviously, we're huge board game fans. They have big board game collections as well. And then through this process, um, as well as doing like research into it, Paul and I have also started to design games. And I guess the tagline we kind of have in the games that we design are, uh, we, we make games that start conversations. So the idea was to move away from games that are traditionally labeled as edgy games, which, yeah. um, you know, nobody actually wants to play of their own volition. No. And instead to make games that are fun uh, and that are games for game's sake and that actually, 
rather than having like reams of text that people read off the cards or flavor text that nobody reads, it's actually through playing the game and through the mechanics of the game that um, specific information is conveyed and dialogues can start to take place. So that's how we've ended up um, doing research. And we've, we've been really, really fortunate as well. So Paul and I also have a column in Tabletop Gaming Magazine yeah. called Play It Smart, Not Our Choice, <laughs> in, 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 which, um, in which we talk about, you know, we talk about games from an academic perspective. But really what we try to do as well is to I try, try it, it sounds quite a lofty aim, but we're really trying to break down those ivory towers that people associate with academia and say, look, research can be fun as well as being insightful and just try to offer something a little bit different about, um, for people to consider when they're playing tabletop games. So that's, that's where we now find ourselves. That's, that's a lot to unpack, <laughs> as you would say. <laughs> And there's certain parts I'm going to let you off with, and there's certain parts that I have to <laughs> dig in deeper. I'm interested as being, um, as you could probably anyone could guess, I used to do, I used to do a bit of theatre. Um, but in terms of what you're talking about with what you were doing in Japan, was that kind of like the the Brian Cox style of kind of? Demonstrating no, certain, or was absolutely it absolutely not? What were you doing then? Because I'm now fascinated. Would you, you know, were you actually writing kind of like semi dramatical representations, or how did it? What were you actually doing? That's e- exactly what I was doing. So really? I was basically, I was so I was working at the um, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and oh. I was working with students, teaching them how they can use theatrical technique to develop effective communication skills, wow. but then also working with them to write um, dramas that they then took over to China to look at the um, relationship between um, Chinese and Japanese students. At the same time, I was also doing work experience um, with Yukio Ninagawa, the, the famous director, mm-hmm. um, and basi- basically just sat watching um, Cymbeline and other Shakespearean plays being performed in archaic Japanese and understanding about one in 200 words. But it was a, it was certainly an experience. It's not different from normal Shakespeare. I mean, my own... Well, I, it, well, I mean, no. My take on Shakespeare is I've always believed that Shakespeare in school has fundamentally been taught completely incorrectly and that it is almost like um, it's... <clears throat> It is trying to teach somebody how good something tastes by getting them to read a recipe 50 times and then expecting <laughs> that person to fully appreciate the different, the mixture of flavours and how it hits the palate and the consistency on the tongue and how they feel once they've eaten the, the thing. And I think one of the, the way that Shakespeare had an impact on me in a, as a younger person was that, um, one of the English teachers was, you know, they were quite um, a little bit forward thinking and we were doing the Merchant of, Ve- Merchant of Venice and uh, they said, okay, um, they could tell that the class weren't taking it in. You know, it's the, it's the what, you know, for anyone that's not read the Merchant of Venice and I don't blame you for not because it's a, as usual with normal Shakespeare, it's pretty inaccessible unless you actually see it. But they decided to roll in um and this is what you used to have in high schools. You used to have a videotape player that used to roll in on a stand <laughs> with a big, huge TV. And they sat down and they put on the, I think it was the BBC adaptation of um, The Merchant of Venice, I think it was, with, um, was it Warren Mitchell playing Shylock? And um, that blew me away. You know, actually seeing the characters kind of interact. It had... Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it had John Nettles in it as well. You know, Bergerac. Oh, wow. Yeah, of course. And Midsummer Murders. Who could, who could exactly. forget John Nettles? <laughs> who could forget? <laughs> I obviously, I never watched the Midsummer Murders because he would always going to be Bergerac to me. But to me, that was kind of like that, um, what that did, that demonstrated to me that this was the pure beauty of seeing Shakespeare was actually seeing it kind of portrayed in front of you. And I remember seeing, like, going and seeing Macbeth. 
or the Scottish, what well, doesn't matter, I can call it the Scot. don't have to call it the Scottish play because I'm not treading the boards, but it was kind of like seeing seeing that and the dramatic effect you could kind of have on people and how it could kind of influence them, where if they read it on the page they were just like, I don't care how hoarse the raven is, you know, <laughs> not, <laughs> not really that fussed. <laughs> You know, no, don't really care. I mean, she likes to wash her hands. You know, doesn't everybody? It's a bit of a germy environment out there. But was that was that what you were trying to elicit? Was it kind of communication, emotional responses, and stuff like that between people in terms of levels of communication? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think just you know trying to get um, students who are thinking about being prospective scientists mm. that just because they wanted to do science didn't mean that they have to be restricted to only doing science mm-hmm. and that, you know, that they shouldn't be put into boxes that other people label, but rather they should be free to express themselves in a variety of different art forms and hobbies and other areas that they're, they're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. When, with the, with the stuff that you're kind of doing, doing now, I mean, you said you've got quite a, a large collection do you take the time to kind of look at them and study them kind of from an academic point of view as well then? I mean, are you, have you got the ability, you've obviously, you'll have the ability just to sit down and enjoy a game, but also because of what you're kind of getting involved in now, and we will go into it, um, do you sometimes look at stuff from a kind of a, a critical point of view and saying, well, where I could use this game doing this or I could use this mechanic kind of doing that? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, I think with several of the games that we play and talk about in our column, for example, we'll we'll try and do like a critical read of them. But I think Paul and I both, when we play games, and Paul comes from an English background, so he's far more intelligent than I am in terms of critical critically reading things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess when we're looking at games and playing them, there's very much this thing of, oh, this is a really nice mechanic. Yeah. Or this has got a, a really nice theme attached to it. Is this something that we could then start to use in a classroom environment or start to use in um, a public engagement setting to start to elicit conversation around? I mean, the perfect example would be um, terraforming Mars. So, you know, as soon as we played that, we were like, oh, wow, this is such a cool game to start people having a conversation around what it would actually be like to terraform Mars. Mm-hmm. So we, we, you know, after playing that for a couple of times, we, we, we worked, we reached out to the Institute of Physics and then we, we ran a couple of training sessions in which we used the game as a, as a segue to conversation. And what was really cool about that game was that, you know, it's, yeah, it's so well researched and it's so beautifully put together in terms of the mechanics, mm-hmm. but, it's not just reading the flavor text. It's actually by the, when you play the game, you kind of realize that terraforming Mars is really, really hard. So why on earth would you want to do, why would you want to terraform Mars? <laughs> and then it makes you think, why are we investing all of these, this money in potentially terraforming yeah. Mars when instead we could be using it to save our planet? Yeah. You know, so like having those conversations are really, really cool that can come out of just playing a game that has a really intricate mechanic. And I guess sometimes when we play games, we think to ourselves, okay, you know, Terraform Mars again being a good example. This is a game that for, for like people who have played lots of games before isn't particularly complex. Um, you know, it's, you know, a work placement game to all intents and purposes, but and like an engine builder. But the, if you're somebody who's never played games before, it probably is quite overwhelming. So what we try to think about is, okay, how can we modify this game to make it accessible so that people who have never played games before can do it? And what we found with Terraforming Mars is if you play it as a four player game, but rather than using four players, you have eight and people double up. Mm-hmm. It's a really cool way to then enable people to like use the downtime to plan their next move and to elicit further conversation as well. So I think something that Paul and I have got really good at is looking at games that already exist commercially off the shelf available games and thinking, how can we make slight modifications or changes to those in order to take it to an audience that's maybe never played a game before mm-hmm. or maybe thinks that tabletop games are Monopoly or Ludo and introduce them to this whole new world instead so i think in terms of a critical eye that's maybe something that i i definitely do more of now than i used to do in the past 
in terms of um, kind of changing games, one of the things that you know you you were kind enough to send me kind of a link over to to one of the the kind of the studies you were involved in, which was the use of Catan and creating almost like a generating an expansion for Catan, which took into account kind of like the you know the environmental impacts and. I'm just interested to find out kind of how, what made you decide, I mean, obviously Catan or, you know, Catan itself is, you know, is seen as one of the stable games, you know, that most people who get into the hobby will know, will certainly be aware of it, if not, you know, have at least played it. Um, but what was your, what was your thoughts behind kind of taking something like Catan and, and kind of trying to kind of start off what you said, you know, you enabling the, enabling the conversation regarding the effects of, you know, this on the environment and things like that. Absolutely. So I think Paul and I wanted to use a game that w- worked as a game that was well underst- well established by the gaming community and that, you know, would have a appeal. And obviously Catan's a bit of a, <laughs> some people love it, some people hate mm. it, right? But it's a, it's a beauty. It's got a really, really great mechanic. And also it's a game that people play and you think to yourself, okay, we're using resources. We're using resources and there's just limitless resources. Mm-hmm. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make a game in which there isn't a limited resources. Um, that, and so we introduced various mechanics that, that change it and that actually tie it into the more resources you use, the more you're maybe potentially increasing, um, the effects of global warming over the Catan island and yeah. so it then becomes a, 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 a very different game in which players have to trade off with each other whether or not they're going to um you know for example instead of taking wood or or sheep or sorry wood or wool or what, lumber or whatever mm-hmm. players can choose to overmine that area so they get two resources instead of one or four resources instead of two right if you've got a city yeah or they can choose to leave it fallow in which case they don't take any resources, but the risk of the environment warming up goes down slightly. So it becomes this really nice, you know, semi collaborative game actually in a way. And, you know, there's a, there's a really nice mechanic in, in the game where either if it gets to a point where the, the game ends because of global warming, either nobody wins or the person with the most victory points at that point wins. But that's something you have to decide at the very start of the game. Yeah. So that, and that introduces further conversations as well. So, you know, and I'd really encourage, you know, your listeners to check out that game. You can get it for free as a print and play on the Manchester Game Studies Network right, website. Okay. And it was, you know, it was really great. Um, developing that we we wrote off to um to Tauber just to say look are we are we okay to do this and everything and Catan got a really good um fair use policy so they were really happy about that yeah. and um it was it was a great experience and what we're doing now is um we're we're, we're going to try and conduct even more research into okay so just how effective has that game been potentially mm-hmm. at developing dialogue um because you know the print and play game's been downloaded and played about two and a half, three thousand times. So it's, it's done fairly well. Um, but what's really, really interesting now is to, to see if that's actually having an impact. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a case of you seeing if it's been actually used in kind of academic circles and teaching circles as well. I mean, from in a general point of view, and I'm aware, obviously, the continual politics of this, you know, entire situation. Is it, are you still very surprised that, you know, in, in the year 2019 that we're still having, it's not a case that we're having the discussion about how do we deal with this potential climate, you know, the potential change in climate, which, you know, like mm. today has been unbearable, but we're actually still having to have the conversation where we're actually needing to, to have arguments with people. And I don't mean shouting at them, though you feel like shouting at them sometimes, that this is actually a thing, that there's people that are still yeah. kind of denying so it. So I think it's, no, it's, it's a really interesting question. So there's a study literally came out uh, this week, which um, looked at scientific consensus for anthropogenic climate change. So that is, to what extent were scientists convinced that climate change or the climate catastrophe mm-hmm. is human made? Yeah. And 99% of all scientific studies ever published on climate change, which, you know, into the tens of thousands agree that it is anthropogenic. Yeah. 
And, you know, this is a figure that's been above the 90s for the past decade or so, longer than that. So it's something that scientists have always known. Now, the problem is, and I guess where part of my research in science communication comes, is that scientists aren't always best, aren't always great at at having a conversation about stuff. And we know as a fact that actually just because people possess facts doesn't mean that they're able or willing to make lifestyle choices to reflect upon that. So in terms of communicating climate change, what we really need to be doing of the climate catastrophe, what we need to be doing much more is as scientists, we need to be living, listening to non-scientists, listening to their needs, listening to their experiences, listening to their knowledge and using that as a way to help us to frame how we talk about climate change. Now, the climate catastrophe is a global interdisciplinary problem that is going to affect everybody. Yes. It's not just going to affect scientists. And because of that, we need to have solutions that come from everybody, not just scientists. It's arrogant of scientists to assume that they're the only ones with the answers. And it's lazy of non-scientists to assume that only scientists are going to be able to have a say. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, science for many, many years creates a barrier, either perceived or real, in which people feel as though they're not welcome to express their opinions, their needs and their experiences, which we know to be absolute baloney. And we know we could take only someone like, for example, Greta Thunberg, like she's not a scientist, like by, like she hasn't got a doctorate, but yeah. she's done more than I will ever achieve in my entire life in terms of in terms of pushing forward the agenda and making a positive impact on the world in which we live. And so we need to ensure that everybody has this voice. And we also need to remember that often some of the most um, vulnerable and disadvantaged people through no fault of their own are the people that have the lowest impact on the climate catastrophe. Yes. And yet they are the people that are going to suffer the most from it. Yes. Yes. So why aren't we listening to their needs and their experiences? And what, what we propose, what Paul and I propose, is that games are actually a really, really powerful way of starting people to have that debate and creating a safe space around a table in which people can start having topics of conversation. And it's not just saying, you know, climate catastrophe is bad, stop flying. It's, let's just, we need to talk about this. We need to work out the levels of perception. There was a study done several, uh, three years ago at the Yale Climate Lab, which looked at how many Americans, and I'm not picking on America, just this is where the study was done, how many of them thought global warming was real? It was over 70%, not bad. How many of those people thought global warming would affect the US? 50%, yeah. not great. Yeah. How many of them thought that it would affect them personally? 40%. Yeah. How many of them thought that it, how many of them had a conversation at least occasionally with their friends or colleagues? 33%. Yeah. So if only a third of the population are talking about the problem, then how are they going to possibly solve it? So, you know, this thinking was really very much behind the current game that Paul and I have been developing Mm -hmm. um, called Carbon City Zero. And this is a game that we've been developing with the climate charity 1010 Climate Action and which launches in Kickstarter in the beginning of September. Oh, okay. And in this game, it's basically a deck builder, a bit like Dominion or Star Realms. And what you're doing is you are the mayor of a city and you are racing to become the first... Um, city to be carbon zero, to have zero carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And you know, you start, you start off with pretty dodgy cards like poor housing stock or remote properties, but then you can, you can improve your deck as you go along. And the idea behind this game is, you know, there's, there's no flavor text on the cards, but the, the, the game, in order to succeed at the game, there's several strategies, but one thing you have to be able to do is you have to interface between industry, housing and local government. And so through playtesting, and we've playtested it with um, pol- with policymakers, with community groups, with students, with other members of the public and various publics, the thing that's come across is that one of the messages that's clear is that, oh, okay, so in order to do this, we can't work in isolation. We need to work together. Mm. No, And for yeah. me, that's a really powerful learning outcome to be able to come from from playing a game. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's become it's become a polarised politicised kind of tagged on agreement kind of thing isn't it on certain sides of the political spectrum if you are on that spectrum then disagreeing with what's happening with climate change is kind of like 
is almost like it's tagged alongside everything else, like free healthcare for everybody or free education for everybody or kind of social Absolutely. housing for people. So it's, it's unfortunately rather than it becoming, um, uh, rather than it becoming something which is kind of um, centralised, it's a case that it's almost a case that if you are, you know, if you are one of these, you know, if you're somebody that's like, well, we need to, this is something we need to sort out, you seem to have been politicised to being put on the left. And I don't know if that is because in America, you know, there's the political landscape is generally about kind of lobbying and that the coal, oil, Industries have a massive pull in government, so if policies that are coming through are generally coming through on the Republican side of the House, and therefore, you know, the polarization that's happening in America at the moment almost puts people who are, you know, it's like if you help save the planet, you're going to destroy the economy, which to me is a an absolutely crazy concept. But there, you, there you go. I and it's actually changed because I remember, um, and you'll probably remember this as well, is that the the whole CFC thing when the you know when the ozone layer kind of thing kind of first kicked off, um, and it was like, look, there's this huge hole in the ozone layer, and we need to ban these uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Um, try saying that five times fast, but it just seemed <laughs> it just seemed to be a case of everybody down their tools and rent. Oh my goodness, if this is happening, that's it. And we just, it was almost a well, case absolutely. of CFCs. Yeah. It was unit. Well, the Montreal, yeah, the Montreal Protocol, which, you know, basically put a stop to CFCs is a perfect example of how yeah. scientific, effective science policy can cross political lines and actually be very, very beneficial. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this comes back to the whole thing about people's needs, people's experiences, people's behaviours. There absolutely absolutely needs to be a need to depoliticise the climate catastrophe. Um, But one of the ways you can go about doing that is by talking to people about, you know, their experiences, about the things that they love, you know, about about nature, you know, but also focusing on the positive elements of things rather than constantly giving people negatives to focus on. Because what we find through climate communication research is, giving people negative attitudes, what it does is it, it disables them from actually taking action. Yes. So instead, you know, a far more powerful thing is to get people to think about an element of nature, think about an element of the environment in which they love, in which they enjoy spending time, you know, like mm-hmm. a favourite canal or a favourite walk or a favourite park. And then just think about what would happen if that wasn't there anymore. And, you know, that's a far more powerful way of doing it than telling people and berating people to behave a certain way. But... <laughs> The most important thing is to have a conversation and to be talking about it and yeah. to be talking about it openly. And, you know, coming back to games again, you know, not just for the climate catastrophe, but for many, many subjects, games offer that really powerful way for you to be able to have a discussion about things. Um, and, you know, like I said, creating this safe space in which you're around a table, you can, you know, do things to players that you wouldn't normally do in the real lives, but, you know, backstab them mm-hmm. or cheat or, mm-hmm. or trade with them, whatever. And it, it just creates this environment that's incredibly conducive to conversations and to meaningful exchanges of dialogue. Yeah. And I think people be, need to be having a conversation, even if everybody got around the table and basically said, well, yeah, actually, um, I don't know if there is, is anything that we can do. We're just going to have to kind of rough ride it out kind of thing. But I think we need to kind of distance ourselves away. I mean, the other thing that I get, the other thing that I see is, you know, um, don't buy any more plastic water bottles. And people go, okay, yeah, I won't. And look, here's me doing my bit, not buying plastic water bottles. And then you'll get somebody underneath rather than congratulating them and saying, great, you've bought like a, you know, you've bought like a, a, a kind of a multi-use glass bottle instead that you're going to be using to store water. And they're saying, well, that's not going to stop the plastic bottle manufacturer from continuing to make 10,000 bottles a day. And you're just like, we kind of need to move away from that <laughs> because that's them making that person say, well, what's the point in me actually taking any action at all? And I totally agree with you. We need to make it kind of, kind of positive and make people feel that they are, they're kind of, um, they're kind of con- contributing at the same at the same time um have from you play testing the game has that put kind of other topics that you can um kind of gamify as well 
I mean, obviously, you know, you're talking about in general kind of scientific kind of communication, but as as it gives you a raft of ideas to think, well, kind of what else can we do? How else can we help kind of um, kind of bridge the gap here and, and and kind of get more people involved in kind of general kind of scientific ins- uh, discussions as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to give any way of our, all of our future design ideas, but, just tell, but just basically, you know, just <laughs> no, no, but it, it also is just, you know, most, most times we play games, I think we think to ourselves, okay, well, this is a, a great hook, um, for talking about, um, you know, a contentious topic. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for example, games would be a, games would be a fantastic way, way to start talking about like, you know, genetically modified food or something like that. We could, or like the, so, the issue of soil degradation, mm-hmm. have a huge game of agric- agricola and start, you know, talking about, look how complex agriculture and farming is and how many different elements are involved here. Now, what would happen if we modded this game to have a GM component in agricola? Or what would happen if we modded this game to have um, a component in which unless you had a certain amount of wildflowers being planted every year in fallow season, then the soil would degrade. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can make these like small modifications to, to already existing games that, that make them really powerful, not just learning tools, because learning implies like a one way direction, but you know, these powerful tools for conversation. And that's what for me as an educator and as a communicator and as an academic really appeals to me about, tabletop games because they're so easily modifiable and I don't necessarily have to design a game from scratch yeah. in order to start these conversations. I can go and pick a game off my shelf and then, you know, there's a game that's borders on the topic, borders on most topics that we can start to have a think and a, ch- a chat about. And that's some of the really interesting work that we do, mm-hmm. which is when we work with other academics um, to, you know, pick games from our games library or order games in specifically that we can then start to use in those teaching and learning environments to have real conversations. So, you know, for example, um, we, we worked with a, a colleague in microbiology and we we're really, really interested in talking about antimicrobial resistance. And, you know, one of the big things about antimicrobial resistance is that um, and again, I'm not to patronize, but a lot of people don't know that, um, antibacterial, you know, drugs only work on diseases caused by bacteria. They don't work on diseases caused by viruses. Yeah. So it's really important getting people to realize that there's different types of diseases. Some are caused by viruses. Some are caused by bacteria. Some are caused by parasites. Some are caused by fungi. And we wanted to have a game that like enabled people to start talking about this. And, you know, the first game that comes to mind is Pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but then the cool thing about Pandemic, which is apart from being a brilliant game, is it's got all these great expansions. So Pandemic Iberia doesn't just have generic disease one, disease two. It actually has um, diseases that exist in the real world. So cholera, um, malaria, um, typhoid. So these are diseases that some of which are caused by bacteria, some of which are caused by viruses, and some of which are caused by by parasites in the case of malaria. So it's a really, really cool game to get people thinking about, oh, all of these diseases are this. And then in in Pandemic Iberia, you because it's set in like the 1800s, you can never actually cure the disease. You can only stop it spreading. And one of the ways that you can do that is by making sure that you have a lot of purified water. So that sends a really powerful message about how important cleanliness is and, you know, about how rather than being reactionary, preventative measures are far more effective in, in fighting disease than um, than, than, than drugs um, after the fact. And then the other thing, the great thing about Pandemic Iberia is that, and Pandemic in general is that it really demonstrates that this whole process isn't just a single scientist in a lab, right? It's also logistics specialists. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's researchers. It's town mayors. It's, it's nurses. It's railway men. It's, <laughs> it's a really cool game for demonstrating how, um, real research isn't just the preserve of scientists but requires a meaningful collaboration with people from all aspects of society working together in collaboration and that just comes from a game a really cool game that um 
brilliant game designers have done and which people enjoy learning. But then we know that when we talk to them afterwards about their experiences and what they felt from playing the game, it conveys these really powerful messages about cooperation and, and then in this instance, you know, about uh, antibacterial resistance and how different diseases can spread as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, kind of, I think the joke, not the joke of the moment, but one of the things is, is the next version of Pandemic going to have, you know, anti-vaxxers as a potential mm. Kind of source of you know, you draw a card, you That's get really an epidemic. You could, have a betray- you could have a be- you could have a betrayer mechanic, right? It you is, could have a betrayer mechanic of much anti-vaxxers like, in there. It is, it's pretty much like a dead of winter kind of thing. Where exactly everybody kind of right. Puts dead of winter, winter crosses pandemic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There you go. Trademark it. Done. <laughs> exactly. There we go. That's us. That's and that's us now. Um, thousand years until we get sued, <laughs> and we both kind of lose our. Are, are kind of our houses. Um, <laughs> one of the things that seems to be <clears throat> becoming the a discussion point again and again is that, um, and you see them on Kickstarter all the time, and in fact you see them in a lot of expansion boxes. In fact, you know, normally when you get a game, um, there's some components of this involved, which is the plastic components of board games. And, you know, I'm not going to single out kind of Kickstarters with, you know, they do have a lot of kind of minis and stuff like that, um, which are obviously all plastic, which are going to be there probably long after people have stopped, you know, potentially playing them. Do you think that's a conversation that the board game industry maybe needs to have with itself to actually say, well, you know, this is all fantastic and great, but one of the things that we're, we're, we're kind of being mindful of is we are helping huge amounts of plastic getting manufactured in China, mm. getting shipped over here, and then it is going to be here in kind of perpetua. Um, I've noticed a couple of conversations, I think Ross from More Games Please has recently brought up a couple of issues regarding packaging and being sent kind of expansions which were in a massive box with the actual mm. expansion itself. I know that I watched um, um, the Shut Up and Sit Down and watched Quinn's doing his uh, review of uh, too many bones, and one of the things he highlighted is: look, there's a there's a container here that comes with the plastic chips that you use for the game. The container itself is made out of plastic. The cards themselves are made out of plastic. The 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 box for the cards, rather than having a simple kind of paper band around them, it's a fully formed kind of plastic box. Do you think that's a conversation we maybe need to start having with ourselves before it becomes a standard? You know. Absolutely. And I don't want to, you know, be the person to like be accused of throwing stones or anything because there's, there's, there's lots of things that need to be done. But mm. I think that if, if the board game, um, if board gamers decided to start, you know, voting with their feet or their credit cards and purchasing games that, um, that were m- more wood based, for example, you know, is it, um, Junkyard's got like a plastic version and a wooden version, right? Yeah. Like by the wooden version, and, you know, we talk about printing in China, but actually China gets quite a bad rep sometimes because China plants millions of trees. That's, yeah, it does. Specific. It's like, it's like, it's a billion pound, uh, it's a billion dollar, um, industry. Well, not a billion dollar, like, project every year to replant the trees to offset the amount of paper and cardboard that they use in their factories, which is amazing. And people don't talk about that enough because I think that's really impressive. Yeah, I think yeah, I think and China's China's kind of looked as like uh, as the kind of the fence. It's like all the countries are kind of shoplifting stuff, and they're they're giving it to China to sell on, and then the police turn up at China's door and going, "You're doing all these bad things," and they're like going, um, "Well, kind of, maybe I am, but also at the same I time, I would be doing yeah. this if people weren't sending me all this stuff, you know, to kind of sort." Absolutely out. right, and I think. And I think in many instances, there's a, you know, we, we can be thinking as board games designers of how can we make this out of a more sustainable um, mm. format or, you know, can we use wood here? Can we use tokens here? Can we use paper here? Is this something we could ask the gamers at home to, like, you know, use a token for instead? You know, is this something we could ask the gamers at home to like, use dice for instead? And, you know, tabletop RPGs are a great example of they that, are. aren't they? Because yeah. You know, look at D and D. I mean, you can, you play in D and or you really, 
if I mean, yeah, you can have like all the minis and everything like that, but theoretically you can play it with the player's handbook, the Dungeons Master's Guide, and then just a load of paper and pens and some dice. Yeah, I heard, and yeah. the possibilities of that game are almost endless. Yeah, I heard something interesting the other day. I think it was Dan Hughes. Um, just the other day was talking, I think it was on the Guild with Ben Maddox about games workshops, kind of business model and how um, they had to look at changing their business model quite dramatically because what was happening was they were selling people um, kind of all of these armies that they were using. and But then once people got to a certain size of armies, they weren't buying any more product because they pretty much had everything that they needed. And they were just, you know, they were painting the minis and then they were just playing with the same things. And it was a case of they were saying, well, you know, the way that Games Workshop had to almost kind of create a hostile environment for these players in order to attract new people who were then going to go and kind of kind of purchase things. I've always wondered about... Um, a game company that basically um, uses a generic kind of set of pieces and maybe releases like, a, you know, it could be a, a linen cover for a board or something like that, you know. And what you do is when you get the game, you get the linen cover of the board to put on top of it and then you can use, you know, the pieces to represent the tokens and, and kind of play it that way. And, you know, I think, um, you know, I think that's a, a way forward. What about... Um, because one thing um, that's been announced by um, Simon was, um, and I'm going to get this completely wrong, uh, is uh, Tembura, I think it was called, which is basically like an interactive kind of electronic mat. But the applications for that, while they seem to be kind of, you can now completely electrolyze your game, there's also kind of options there to basically be able to have like a generic mat and then have multi different games kind of played off that, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting. But I don't see a lot of discussions about it, which is why I kind of brought it up with your, you know, with, brought it up with yourself, you know, um, in terms of the environmental impact on continually making lots and lots of plastic and not looking at our sustainability and our environmental policies. Mm. Yeah, and I think you know this is absolutely something that. If you just do a back of the envelope calculation of, you know, how many games get sold on Kickstarter every year and how many, how much of that is made, then that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know, the caveat to that is that if these are games that are played regularly and kept in the house and, you know, and reused and recycled as in what I meant, give to other players mm. and like repurposed, which board game, which <laughs> board game must do a really, really good job of, right? Yes. Um, I think, you know, that's a really powerful way. And, you know, I don't want to be the person that's the killjoy in saying all that, but rather coming back to what we were talking about earlier, it's a conversation that needs to take place, right? And mm -hmm. it's not about pointing fingers and no. it's not about saying you do this, you don't do that, but it's a, you know, hey people, have we thought about this? And, you know, often what happens in those situations is that somebody comes up with an idea and innovation that then makes the whole industry even better than it was before right yes so if if so thinking about that and i guess when we design with carbon city zero we're trying to be as sustainable as possible keeping it to minimum components trying to avoid plastic wrapping where we can um you know but then giving the caveat that when people get the game it, you know it might be slightly battered right because it's not got a plastic wrapper on it but that's the price that you pay for not having a plastic wrapper so you know thinking about those those little things that you're willing mm -hmm. to overlook or that you're willing to concede on in order to have um, maybe a great environmental game would be really good so the rumors about you giving people a free panda with every copy that's not that's not true <laughs> Sadly, sadly, <laughs> sadly, grossly, grossly <laughs> not true. Well, as long as I was just thinking, because, you know, bamboo. I mean, everything seems to be made out of bamboo. <laughs> Nowadays you're getting clothing. I just thought, you know, you might want... It'd be an interesting thing, Free Panda, with her environmental game, just to kind of see people's reactions, because I would, like, stir it up. That's what I would do. You know, I would... Uh, <laughs> now, just, and it's... But it's really interesting that you said environmental game as well, because like what we're really trying to do is that people see this as a game first. So, yeah. you know, that it's a, it's not like, a, oh, this is trying to teach us a message. It's a, <clears throat> this looks like a really cool game. And we've got, 
we've got amazing artwork. Like I'm obviously going to say that, but it looks really good. So, you know, hopefully it's this thing where people play it and pick it up and they go, oh, this is really good. It's got a really nice mechanic. It's mm. really fun to play. And oh, hold on a second. I think I've just had a conversation about what it means to be a zero carbon city. How did that happen? <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that, that's what we're really looking for rather than a, oh, I'm going to play this worthy game about being a zero carbon city it's not like that at all it's look at that artwork yeah. look at that gameplay let's play it and then wow we've had a conversation as a result of it well if i mean going back to pandemic i mean that did a, a really good kind of way of teaching people potentially how about as you said how about infectious diseases spread and things like that anyway so it's not a case that you're kind of it's kind of almost promoting conversation about a subject through stealth so that people end up talking about it, but it's not something that feels kind of, you know, kind of tacked on. You know, it's Absolutely. not like it's science. Science through stealth. That's that's what we're all about. That is that is the name of our. That is actually the name of my uh, my, my second album for my synth pop band. Um, in terms of, um, you know, with you touching on kind of science and, and the gamification of it, is there educational? You know, uh, over and above this, is there kind of educational kind of applications for something like this? I mean, could you be? So I think, yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting question. I think the the thing is with games, right? In an educational capacity, and we've done a lot of work working in schools with games. Mm -hmm. You need to think about the actual limitations of the games. So you're going into a school environment. There's going to be X number of children in the class. You're going to have 50 minutes to play the game. You're going to have Need to, so you're going to need to teach them how to play the game. You're going to need to play the game. And then you, in order to really have any meaningful discussion, you're going to need to have a debrief afterwards as well. You need to do all of that in 50 minutes or, you know, you might get a double lesson, but that's, that's quite rare to do. So it's really thinking about what games can you use in those environments. Great examples would be the flux variations from Looney Labs, right? Like yeah. maths flux, chemistry flux, yeah. physics flux. Yeah. Um, but, you know, other games like, um, you know, if we're thinking about like numeracy or literacy, you know, I think games like Bananagrams and things are really, really ga games that people can pick up really quickly, play, and then you can have a conversation and dialogue around as well. So we're really interested. What, what we'd love for Carbon City Zero is really actually as for the gaming community to be like, this is a cool game. Oh, and it's making me think about this. Yeah. But also for poli for policy makers, for local councillors, for people who can make decisions in their personal and professional lives about carbon budgets to play the game and go, oh, this is a great way to start talking about this issue. This is a great way to start thinking about what it means for my city that I live in or that I manage or that I'm a part of to be zero carbon. So as well as, you know, potentially thinking about how to take it into schools and how teachers can use it as a learning resource, mm -hmm. it's, we hope for it to be more than that and for it to be, you know, educational, but in a two, in a two directional way and outside of the formal learning environments as well, which bring their own restrictions. Yeah, I know that um that there's um there's a company that specialise in using the Minecraft game in order to teach things, you know, aspects of architecture and constructions and things like that. It's in a fascinating way to do things. I've always wondered if um almost like some kind of legacy mechanic with a game, because I I mean, you were young, I was young. I remember being at primary school, especially maybe primary five, six and seven, where there would be like a class project for, you know, the term. And I would always wonder... The Tudors, if the Egyptians, the, Romans, the Victorians. The Romans, <laughs> you know, roads, the sea, space, you know, um, whiskey. But I don't know if that was just my teacher at the time because they liked to sample it <laughs> an awful lot. You know, Friday afternoon, let's get this done class. And uh, there we go. But I always wonder if the impact of some kind of legacy game where the kids, as they were learning stuff, were taking kind of decisions which then built upon the continual kind of game itself. You know, so at the end of the 13 weeks kind of term, um, then 
they would have a game that they would play. I'm thinking, you know, like something like Charter Stone or something like that, where it doesn't have to be incredibly complicated, but it can be something that can be um, quite interesting to do. That's the thunder and lightning on, <laughs> basically. Um, I don't know if you can hear that in the background, Sam. No, no, I can hear it absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite- so in, 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 yeah, in the northwest of England, where we we had it about earlier on in the day, and it was it was quite extreme. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but yeah, no, I can kind of see see things like that anyway. But um, you said that the have you got um. If you've got kind of details for the game, as we say, have you got kind of like ideas of prices and launches on the Kickstarter and everything like that at all? Yeah, so we're hoping for the Kickstarter to go live um, around the week beginning the eighth of September. Okay. Um, if people want, if people want updates of the game, they can go to the um, ten ten um, climate action climate action website and okay. sign up for the newsletter. All the details will be there, and we're still working out price points exactly. Um, but what we're really, really keen on is making it a game that most people will be able to afford. Cool. So the other thing to say is that we're not making any money from the game. Mm-hmm. So all of the profits of the game we're using to buy more copies of the game, which we're then going to give to local community groups and schools so that they can then play the game themselves as well. One cool thing I'll tell you about that we are certain about is one of the pledge levels. So... For a certain amount of money, we're going to encourage and invite cities to bid to be an actual card in the game. So our artist will design your city in the style of the game, and then your city will feature permanently in every single deck of cards. So, you know, if you want to be Edinburgh, if you want to be Bristol, if you want to be Manchester, so really to try and simulate this real race that's <laughs> going on to be the, U- the UK's first zero carbon city. And we think that's a really nice pledge level that we can hopefully generate a bit of excitement and interest and healthy competition around. Is, is there a bow tie pledge level? Is there a bow tie pledge level? Um, maybe we could put something crazy on the top where hand design bow tie or something. I I'll just, come and tie a I bow want, tie for I you. I want something like you have to have something like that with the game's logo on it. I think that would be amazing. You know, we could definitely we could maybe talk to our designer about it. <laughs> the, game, the graphic designer that'd be quite nice. That would be quite cool. That would be quite cool. Um, thank you very very much for your time. Um, I know it's maybe not been gamey enough for everybody, but it has. So stop it. But um, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on, and I, I can only wish you best. Thanks so much for having me. I can only wish you best of luck with the campaign. Obviously, we will make sure that Thanks. we we shall spread the word far and wide when it goes live uh, on September the. 8th, Thanks, Richard. You know? And uh, if people want to, if they've listened along tonight and they said, "Well, I want to," can kind of, Keep an eye on on, on 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 what this gentleman is up to. Where do you exist on the internet webs? How do we find you? Well, you can go to my personal website, which is www.samillingworth.com. That's www.samillingworth.com. Find mm-hmm. me on Twitter at Sam Illingworth. Or probably of more interest, you can go to the Manchester Game Studies Network, which is just manchestergamestudies.org. That's manchestergamestudies.org. Dot org, and you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, we have several events going on throughout the year that members of the public are really welcome to come along and, and join in with. Many blog posts, book reviews, and if you want to get in touch or even think about joining the network as well, we'd really like to hear from you. You can hear from, uh, you can read Paul and me uh, every month in Tabletop Gaming magazine, and Paul and I will also be at Tabletop Gaming Live at the end of September. Uh, with some of our colleagues from 1010 Climate Action to talk to the Dentians of the Ali Pali about Carbon City Zero and what it means to develop a game around climate change. That sounds fantastic. As I say, we'll make sure that we take all of these links and we put them in the show notes so that we have got notes to show. Um, if you'd like to keep an eye on what we're up to, then just go to the internet webs and search for We Are Not Wizards. And you will find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and our website, um, which is wearenotwizards.com and our blog, which is wearenotwizards.blogspot.com where we're continuing to write more and more things. Um, 
previews and sideways glances and opinion pieces and generally old men like me shouting at clouds. Um, If you've enjoyed what you've listened to tonight, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can um, you can tell somebody else about us because we sp- just like pandemic we spread like an unwanted virus, or the with no cure. And the other thing that you can do is you can go to Apple Podcasts and you can you know um, drop us a subscription, or you can drop us a rating, or you can drop us a review. And if you are going to be doing any of those things, remember do not give us ten stars. Because it makes us big-headed. But at the same time, do not give us one star. Because it maketh us cry. Give us something in the middle. Like a five. Because it's average. And we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not been average tonight is rather wonderful. The rather fantastic doctor. Because i got to put that in there. Sam Ellingworth. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Richard <laughs> thank you very much there's only two more things to do the first thing is to remember that we're many things but we're not wizards are we wizards Sam? we are certainly not wizards definitely not unless it's climate wizards then I guess that's kind of acceptable <laughs> uh, and the other thing is to say goodbye so it's a goodbye from Sam say goodbye Sam goodbye And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, make something awful, and um, check out Carbon City Zero when it's out in September. And um, yeah, because it'll be cool and it'll be fun. And we might even write some stuff about it as well. So there you go. But until the next time, goodbye. Wizard is never linked. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to.